Welcome to the Falling Walls Plenary Table, Applying Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to welcome you here at a very, very interesting plenary table that is tackling uh, the mo one of the most uh, uh, crucial questions that we have with regards to AI, AI and medicine. How big can we make a disruption by applying artificial intelligence for medical purposes, in diagnosis, in uh, drug disease management, in research, in imaging, in process optimization? So there is many, many possibilities and many ways how we can actually improve uh, the medical pathway, the patient journey, by applying AI. But of course, there's a lot of different aspects that we need to tackle here as well. So I'm very happy that I will have the pleasure to have this panel here with utmost experts. My name is Dagmar Schuller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Audiring that is especially doing voice AI and empathic AI. And the team that I'm going to be talking to today is really outstanding. So we, you will be, have the will be having the pleasure of meeting really very important researchers that do groundbreaking research in that area that we are talking about. So I would like to introduce you first to Professor Julia Schnabel. Julia is actually fellow of IEEE, fellow of ELIS, and fellow of, of MIKAI. She is the professor for computational imaging and AI at uh, the medicine faculty at Technological University of Munich, jointly with Helmholtz Munich. She studied informatics at the TU Berlin and made her PhD in computer science at University College London after she was professor of engineering science at the University of Oxford, and she became chair in computational imaging at the King's College London. Her research is primarily AI for medical imaging processes. Please welcome Julia. <laughs> My second guest is Wolfgang Brück. He is from University Medical Center Göttingen. He is the chairman of the executive board at the University Medical Center Göttingen and dean of the medical faculty. He has been professor for neuropathology at the Charité Berlin and from 2002 to 2019, the director of the department of neuropathology at the University Medical, uh, medical Center in Göttingen. Please welcome Professor Wolfgang Brück. My third guest today is John Champa from DeepMind. John did his PhD in chemistry from University of Chicago, where he developed machine learning methods to simulate protein dynamics. Prior, he was working at DE Shaw Research on molecular dynamics simulations of protein dynamics. He also has a master in physics from the University of Cambridge and a, a bachelor in science in physics and math from Vanderbilt University. He was also one of the leading scientists in developing AlphaFold from DeepMind. So please welcome John Champa. And now, finally, we have Fabian Theis from Helmholtz Munich. He's the director of Helmholtz Munich Computational Health Center and scientific director of Helmholtz AI. He is a full professor at Technological University of Munich and associate faculty at Wellcome Trust Tenger Institute. He founded the Single Cells Omics Germany, coordinates Munich School for Data Science and co-directs the Alice Munich Unit. Please welcome Fabian Theis. So basically, <clears throat> I'm very happy to have you here all. And um, I would like to directly jump into the questions, especially asking you, Fabian, what was actually the trigger, the most important thing for you to say AI in medicine? That's it. I can make a difference there. That's a good question. You know, I started doing general machine learning stuff and always been sort of applying on very different topics. But then what really changed 
the thing for me focusing on health and then more life science more general is a we can actually do permutations and you know whatever we do in the causal model we can actually test and b the data scale is just so much exploding that you know there's really opportunities to come up with new sort of specialities that you have to sort of fine tune your model to the setting so it's actually a lot of fun lovely thank you so when we're talking about ai and ai in medicine one of the key factors everybody is really considering as essential is basically data. What is your opinion on that, Wolfgang Brück? I think data is, is extremely important, especially the, the quality and the validity of the data that you feed into a system to get out the, the AI results. I think this is the most critical step to select quality-assured data used to feed into the AI systems. Otherwise, you will not get the appropriate results out of an AI machine learning or a system uh, which can be useful for either diagnostics or treatment for patients. So basically, AI can help us tremendously when we talk about AI and medicine, so and also save time and resources. But the critical part regarding data that is always on their mind is bias. So Julia, you have been working a lot with imaging, uh, especially in the sense of medical applications. So how do you actually consider bias as a hurdle factor as, or even somehow as a success factor? What is your opinion there? So we have to be quite clear that if we use AI on images, for example, any other data, that we are building a model, right? And the model could kind of have a trend. So if we, if we have a, a cohort of patients which is not completely balanced, for example, if you've got more men, more young men than elderly women, for example, in the cohort, we've got age difference, we've got ethnic differences, we've got socio demographic differences, then the outcome might not be quite fair. So if we then um, apply the model to, to a patient who doesn't quite fit the model, then the, the, um, the outcome of the model will not be quite accurate. So there will be a drift in the model, there will be just wrong diagnostics based on those images uh, that, uh, that have been included, distilled into the model. So one way of dealing with that is, of course, in an ideal world, we have data which is completely balanced, unbiased. Yeah, but the world is not ideal, right? Our society is not ideal, so there will always be differences. So it's important to, to kind of try and debias the model by, by acknowledging that and by kind of um, using techniques, mathematical techniques, machine learning techniques to kind of rebalance the data. So we can kind of upweight some data, downweight some data, so make some errors more pronounced so that they actually they are taken into account a little bit better. And that hopefully will lead to, to a better outcome, to so better diagnostic um, uh, prediction and, and other things. So bias and fairness in AI. There's a little fly around me. <laughs> Bias and fairness in AI is, 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 is a really hot topic just in terms of methodology. For us, it's beautiful. We can use a lot of things, but we always have to think about the patients at the end of it. So they, it has to work on real data, on real patients. Okay. So basically, especially applications in the wild and not only just in the lab are going to be key in the healthcare sector and with AI in medicine. So when we're talking about AI in medicine, it's actually a little bit too broad. We have AI in medicine, we have AI in biology, and we have AI in drug discovery. Three different type of things. So John, I would like to know, where do you see the biggest benefit or potential? I think. I think all of these areas are really exciting, but one of the things that's really worth focusing on is, you know, medicine's the actual kind of base material of doing medicine, right? Drugs are very, very important. I think a lot of what we see, and I work toward the, you know, atomistic molecular drug discovery end, I think we're, we're poised to see really incredible progress in how we start to make these, how we think about, you know, which kind of proteins can we drug? How do we develop these medicines? And I think that'll feed forward on, you know, timescales that hopefully will become shorter in terms of the timescales of getting medicines ultimately to approval. But it's one of the areas that I'm really excited about in addition to the really direct things like, um, you know, imaging, healthcare, and others. So I think it's really important to distinguish kind of the, the maybe really short term or assisting doctors in using the tools we already have, and then how do we build the next generation of tools and medicines. Okay, lovely. So basically, when we talk about also that subject, as the, third, uh, the four, uh, before question already suggests, 
it's basically a very interdisciplinary field that we are talking about, because a human is quite interdisciplinary, so to speak, and has different type of aspects, and also with regards to the process, there are different type of aspects. So how, how can AI actually help us identify better or new treatments for patients with all this interdisciplinarity? Where do we start? What do we do, Fabian? Yeah, well, we do need to have interdisciplinary people working with us. And I don't know about your backgrounds. I mean, you sort of summarized it a little bit, but I think traditionally many of us went from, you know, math, physics, and so on, you know, at some point then obviously computer science. But I think nowadays the type of person that we need to do these analysis is often what we call data scientists, right? And what's a data scientist in a sense? It's sort of a, a, a mixture of people that are good at, at, at coding, that are good at the stats, math part, but then in particular also have domain knowledge. So you have to put these, these three things together. And to educate these, I think is, is a bit of a challenge. Some, some people sort of start right away in the bachelor, sort of go mixed right away. I have the impression that it's a good idea to be sort of deep first, but then maybe at the postdoc, maybe PhD, maybe even early level, but at some point sort of make it, make it interdisciplinary. In Munich, we set up this Munich School for Data Science to essentially really get people into that direction, and it's really attractive. And you know, we have similar initiatives also on the European level with this Ellis Network, where we actually get people really in various different topics, and I think in the end, I think a big part of our impact will not only be the particular solutions that we do, but really just educating this, this next generation of scientists to then maybe really go into the clinics and then actually implement these things. So basically all this interdisciplinary efforts that you are doing and solving with students and education and everything, um, we always have, I think, in the applicability of AI in medicine, the problem of trust and trustworthiness. And a lot of those things come together with not understanding what's going on. So is AI really this type of black box? Can we have some sort of explainability that we can really actually tackle a patient or even the doctor from a small village to understand what's going on? So Julia, do you have an opinion on that? Well, absolutely, because in the, in the end you have to, to sell this to clinicians, to hospitals, so you have a product. And uh, you, don't, you wouldn't buy a black box thing to, to, on which your life depends without getting some assurance that it actually works, right? You can, you can think of comparisons to self-driving cars or, or, or other tools. You want to know the functionality and you need to test it, of course, uh, for, for potential um, mistakes and, and faults. Um, so before you would bring uh, something into the clinic, you would kind of like almost like in a systems analyst approach, take your model a little bit apart rather than just say, here's an image and there's the prediction you're going to have cancer in 20 years. You want to actually break down the problem a little bit into components. That's one way of doing it. So you show in intermediate results. You show basically to the clinician or the scientist why you think that is the case. Why did my model pick up a potential you know, early detection of cancer? Does it light up somewhere in all those little neurons hidden, hidden in the black box? That's one, one very simple thing. Um, but at the end you have to put it to the test. In the end you have to put it into trial and into randomized control trials, in fact, basically seeing whether, whether your AI system will come to the same diagnosis as the doctor. Again, we would not replace, of course, the healthcare professional, but it would give us reassurance that we get a robust answer that there are no mistakes done on the way, with some failure rate, as is also in human error as well. So basically, the application is a very important thing. So the daily usage, also in routine and medical treatment. So Wolfgang, um, basically, you are working uh, in a clinic every day. What is your big benefit of AI? Do you see it as a system for you that can actually support you? Or is there any other potential? Or where do you, in your daily routine with your clinicians, say, this could be the best thing if this could happen, and where do you see the limitations? I mean, the best thing is clearly that you can support clinicians by either diagnosing or treatment. And uh, if I come back to what you just said, Fabian, when we look today in what we call the so-called molecular tumor boards, mm -hmm. regularly there are people, bioinformatics guys, not like 20 years ago where it was only the pathologist and the treating physician. Since we generate so many data from a tumor, molecular data, protein, proteomic data, they have all to be integrated and we have to find then the right therapy 
for this specific tumor. We don't talk anymore about a lung tumor. We talk about different entities of a single tumor, and we have to find the right therapies. And there, interdisciplinarity is critical since we need to have all people on board. This is what we regularly do now in, in tumor boards. And if we have more advanced AI uh, methods, and if we ask the right questions also to AI, then we may also improve our therapy and improve the outcome of our patients. I think the clinical decision support systems is for the clinician the most important step. Uh, yes, Fabian? May I briefly, because you, I mean, you've been sort of talking about interpretation and then mm -hmm. you've been sort of focusing on what you actually do in the clinical practice. And I have like this, this one maybe point to add is that, that we, nowadays, you know, we can sort of look back once we train the method and then see what was going on, but potentially we can also already bake in some constraints in the method. And, you know, at some point, and you know, you know what I'm thinking about, right? At some point, we just like had these big deep learning things and it was walking out and in, you know, in, let's say, computer vision, in image net, you train something, it's super flexible, you might not actually make constraints. But it turns out, you know, those models, you actually also have some type of convolution or so as a constraint. So I'm wondering if, uh, like how much adding into our models already some simplifying constraint actually leads to interpretability. You know, for us, for example, we do cellular variation type of modeling, and then you know, we build in a little bit that those maybe are close by or somewhat similar. But I, I, I guess this could help you first maybe explain why you make your decision, but you know, maybe also actually improve in the prediction. I think right for you, John, this was sort of a, a key thing. So I think changing the model class to make it more explainable actually is also potentially improving on whatever we do then downstream might be sort of more general or something like that. So basically adding to uh, what you said, Wolfgang, and you, Fabian, John, we have uh, here just at the table people with different scales that they're looking at. We have Julia with imaging, we have Wolfgang with pathology, we have cells with Fabian, and with you, we have molecules. So basically, uh, how do we get this together for a patient? I think that's one of the really, really interesting questions. And in a sense, we, we do this regularly and have for a long time, that uh, we do drug discovery, which is ultimately about developing often small molecules, tens of atoms that you, know, you ingest in, in pill form, and you hope to make the patient better. And it's an incredible kind of scale connection all the way from that molecule to that cellular pathway to ultimately, hopefully, for example, affecting the tumor. And we connect these scales, but we do it over a long time period. We do it with a lot of really painstaking biological work. It's something that we really hope to draw, you know, and I, I think of kind of the research group that I work in as the people that sit next to the atoms, right? I can see the atoms. <laughs> and uh, and how, how we kind of drive those time scale or drive those kind of spatial scales and time scales all the way up to patients is one of the miracles of modern biology, but also one that we need to do a lot better or we need to think about. And one of the really interesting things is like, how do we transfer progress in, you know, so I work in proteins and individual molecules. How do we transfer that up to the cell level? How do we transfer the cells to the patients? And I think we, we're currently building these connections normally very individually. We're training individual neural networks to do individual tasks, but we're all kind of looking and saying, you know, could there be a digital biology? Can we really be connecting these scales outward? You know, will we, will we have major advances in that kind of task in the next 10 years? And I think it's a really exciting time to be asking the question. Absolutely. So um, when we're talking about those treatments that are possible, I think also Global application is one of the things. Can actually uh, this type of methodologies, this type of technology also help us in solving problems of medical distribution and access to, uh, to medical care, especially in areas where there are not that many doctors? And also can this type of uh, um, AI methodology be utilized even by different type of regions or age groups? And um, how can we actually manage to do this? What's the possibility of transformation here? Julia? Well, I mean, it, it takes us a little bit back to bias. So if we train our models on a European cohort, it might not work in, in some Asian countries because just, you know, things are slightly different. Imaging will be different or techniques for, to extract the data might be different. So we have to take some steps in between. So we have to kind of re remold our model. We sort of have to feed the model, um, like one of those sourdough cakes where you have to keep in the fridge and you add some flour every now and then and then you get a cake next week. Um, but you sort of 
add more data, you feed the model one by one and retrain it so it adapts to a new population, to a new cohort and will still kind of work. You, you have to be careful of data drift, so it should still work on your old data as well. That's really important. But you want to kind of augment your model by, by adapting to, to new populations, uh, new cohorts and so on. There are some issues, of course. Um, data in different countries is not only slightly acquired differently, it might be in completely different format. It might be quite heterogeneous as well. You might have, you know, we've got, you know, seven I mean, Tesla, uh, sorry, uh, high field magnetic resonance imaging in some few centers in Europe now, um, but there probably is like one or two in the whole African continent right now. So we, we can't expect these things to work directly. Um, so there, there's still some work to do. But it could actually help to democratize healthcare a little bit by, by using models um, and uh, basically through that gathering knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah, so a model is just kind of a big, big bowl of knowledge yeah, and which might not be readily available in other countries. So they can draw from that and, and use it and repurpose it. And that's, I think, the beauty of AI. Basically, um, this would be a really, really good thing. Uh, however, but in a daily day-to-day -day business, there are always some sort of hurdles when we apply AI in a medical area. So Wolfgang, I would like to ask you, what are your main hurdles? Is it regulatory? Is it more in the applicable use? Or what prevents actually uh, that we can discuss or apply whatever we have here, in your opinion? I mean, first of all, to, it may be easy to use it in a university hospital setting. But it, it may be extremely difficult to use it in a general practitioner, private practice uh, in, in, in all over the world, probably, since you don't have the, the knowledge, you don't know how to use it. And I think this is uh, the major problem, how you get it into the field. Um, at the moment, it's very specifically used in, 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 in uh, um, specialized hospitals, but not in the in the regular way in a, in a regular hospital. It's it's completely uh, at the moment I would say even unimaginable uh, how to imply this in a, in the healthcare system. So Fabian, what do you think? What are the key success factors in actually translating groundbreaking research into applied products or in day-to-day -day medical life? So I, I think the gap towards really clinical usage, that's often a gap that we alone as scientists don't take, right? I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, we're quite happy if we already have a nice model that predicts on one core, maybe generalizes to a second one, and we can write a beautiful paper about it. I mean, that's really cool, and that's sort of typically our check mark. That's kind of what we're being paid for. But then, you know, you actually want, want to take this step. And I, I, I'm actually quite convinced that at some point, many of those challenges actually also turn into engineering type of challenges, right? And maybe are even uh, not a challenge that you can write a beautiful paper about, but then I mean, yeah, I mean, you can do a study and so on. I'm sure there, there are these things. But I think this is also where entrepreneurship is really crucial. We actually need to work together. And we see at some of those best places in the world, such as Boston, there's like this really strong connection of academic research, extra academic research, but then all, also all this start startup and biotech scene. I think if, if you bring this together, then you can actually make some of these steps. I mean, obviously, there's a few, a few of us that then have one of these tests. So we did, for example, one test that's using genetics to predict whether kids get type 1 diabetes or not. That's like something really concrete. You take a bunch of risk snips, and then you can tell the parents already from, uh, from birth on, hey, this could be a high risk. And this is actually something that our colleague has now rolled out all across Germany as a preborn test. So it's, it's a success. It turns out the AI that we actually use there, and we try to make it a bit more fancy, but it's essentially a Bayesian linear regression, right? So it's not super, super complex yet. Mm -hmm. And there are more complex things that you can do with SNPs, but often, you know, there, there's some, some, some time gap for that. So what, what I'm basically just to wrap this statement, I think there's, there's beautiful models. Often we can do something simple, then that, that's maybe already explainable. And at some point, we need to really work also with engineers and people that are better than doing this action implementation in the clinic. Okay. So very, very interesting. Also the story that you just said, success story. I think especially in a company like DeepMind, John, is there anything that you can, I know this is always sometimes a little bit confidential, but share as a practical success story where you say, wow, I never thought that AI could discover this and that thing. Is there something that you could share here? 
I mean, I think one of the things, so the, the AlphaFold model that we, uh, we made is publicly available. And I think one of the really interesting uses is there was a team at Oxford understanding, um, so as we, we all know much more about vaccines now than we really wanted to beforehand, but right, one of the important you know, questions about vaccines is what part, of the, uh, what part of the pathogen do you vaccinate against? How do you take out this little piece as we do with the coronavirus spike? Mm -hmm. And so there was a team at Oxford studying malaria vaccines, and there was a promising protein that they might want to use as the basis for their vaccines, but they didn't understand the structure of it. And so they used AlphaFold in order to help understand the structure and get an idea of how to build the kind of vaccine unit. And I thought it was really, really nice, because I think about being near the atoms, I think about this kind of more longer-term path via drug discovery, which this, in a sense, is, but it's also very direct of, OK, what do we want to put in our vaccines? How are we going to turn immediately our biochemistry knowledge, say, into uh, something very close to medical practice? And I think seeing such kind of a, a short time frame on that has been really exciting for me. I, I could always see the kind of long term, like I really want to understand the molecular biology, but it's nice to also see the really, really short term and the immediate applicability. Lovely. Wolfgang, do you have a success story also in the clinical environment where you say, I, I really did the thing? I would say not yet, so, but I, I would say that concerning uh, in the clinic image analysis is uh, the closest to do either uh, CT or MRI or even pathology. A lot of pathologies are now digitalized, so you don't look anymore into the microscope. You can just send uh, the scanned slides to analysis, and I think this would be is the closest to be used in a daily uh, practice. And uh, this can also then be transferred not from can be transferred from specialized hospitals even to practicing radiologists or pathologists if they just can send in their standardized uh, MRIs to a center who does the uh, analysis. I think there we are from my point of view, the closest to an application also in, in, in new medicine. And imaging leads us again to Julia, of course. So Julia, do you have a success story We say, OK, this could actually be the next thing? Yeah, I, th I think so. I th I'm always working on different strands. But the one which I think was most satisfactory so far was when we worked really for seven, eight years as one big interdisciplinary team with, with cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists, sonographers, um, medical physicists, and, and computer scientists on one project, almost like our moonshot program, where we wanted to make fetal ultrasound, so obstetric ultrasound, give you more automatic answers because it's so highly variable and a birth outcome depends on that a lot. And what we did is we just used AI and trained it on lots and lots of ultrasound. And ultrasound, if you ever looked at it, it's really, really hard to interpret. It's really, it takes a lot of training of the sonographer to get it right. It's, you kind of squeak and say, I think I see something there. Um, it's really difficult to take measurements and do it reproducibly. So what we did, we automated that. We basically had lots and lots of ultrasound streams. You get lots and lots of data. You can train a lot of models on that. And basically, we've got it now being, we have it rolled out in, in pre-trial clinic. We have a trial already on this running. It will be commercialized. But basically, you have now an ultrasound where you just sweep uh, your ultrasound probe as in any direction you want, with pressure, without pressure. And the images are being aligned automatically, being put together. And you get a really nice high resolution, high contrast image with automated measurements and an automated clinical report. It's still being tested and trialed, but I think this is, was for us a, like a little moonshot program, which I'm quite proud of. Lovely. That's, that's really, really very cool. So we see that there is a lot of things going on that could be also implemented in a day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day business for uh, the benefit of the patient. Um, I just want to quickly tackle also on some sort of uh, hurdles that might prevent us a little bit on the regulatory part, although not too much in-depth. Um, I just really want to know your opinion on how do you feel is this uh, regulatory environment that we have here rather supporting or suppressing innovation in AI medicine? Or is there something in between? Fabian, maybe? Yeah, these are the fun questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know, from a pure research perspective, if I want to build the best model on, let's say, electronic health record variation to predict 
say some type of longitudinal event or something like that, we typically don't do this on German data because we don't really have a health record system yet. So, you know, we go to a particularly good hospital where we do have such observations, or we go to UK Biobank, Fin Data, to, to Israel, you know, where there's these big healthcare providers where you can actually do some of these mining. I think, obviously, now, uh, to make this also relevant in the German system and actually to work with colleagues, we need to make an effort to then set some of these things up. And there are big, big steps being made. You know, European Union is talking about health data spaces. There's uh, a lot of stuff happening on the federal level as well as actually also in local governments. For example, in Bavaria, you know, where we can actually sort of shift some, some, some things more. You know, there's been a change to this Krankenhausgesetz that the data, this, the law of the hospital, the data actually does not net, yet need to be stored anymore in the local server in the hospital because that's what it actually had to be before. And you could think you can do some type of federated analysis, so there's these machine learning algorithms that you can actually then bring to the data. You might not want to put things together. But after all, if you really want to have now some useful model explorations on it, it is tremendously useful to have actually something easily aggregated and build these things. So I think there are some advances being made, but you know, there's still obviously a bunch of challenges. So. There are still some uh, things to do, so some potential that could be done to ease the whole process, as I understand. So just generali uh, generalizing, what is your vision for AI in medicine, John? I think, I think for us in at DeepMind, we really see, we really hope to drive big progress in drug discovery itself, is a lot of what we've worked on, and understanding both from the side of understanding of biology and understanding, right, because, you know, ultimately we need to know what we need to do biologically at the kind of detailed low level in order to achieve the patient outcomes. We think there's a lot of prospects that AI is really going to help us understand different aspects of biology. We're going to be able to put them together. We're going to have a much better sense of both how we want to intervene and how we design interventions using, for example, generative tools in biology. And so what we really hope and expect is that this kind of understanding is going to bring down the time to discover new medicines, the time to develop treatments. And I think that will get really, really exciting. And I'm not sure exactly which form it will take. I have theories, but I think really there's a really strong promise that we can use these tools, that we can understand lots of processes within the cells, and this will change the shape of how we build medicines, um, ultimately, and give tools to doctors. And this leads me to the doctor. So what is your vision for AI and medicine, Wolfgang? I think there are three implications. It's a, a diagnosis, a treatment, and the prognosis of the patients. To aid, and I think we, especially in the last years, what you talked about, Fabian, we made several steps. So, due to Corona, we funded the so-called network of university medicines in Germany. So, all 35 university medical faculties and university hospitals now use the same language when they talk about diagnosis. We all established what we call the medical data integration centers, where we integrate all data from healthcare in one system so that we can communicate and exchange these data. And we established a consent for all the patients which is equal uh, in all the, at least in all the university hospitals in Germany. So that we have, I think this was a significant hurdle that we came over now and we are able now to collect millions of data and now we have to apply them and, and use the right systems to diagnose treat or even give prognostic uh, uh, estimations for the single patient. So I think in the last years, Corona gave us a huge step forward in digitalization, but also in, in uh, making is more uniform, at least in the German university hospitals. And I think if we can expand it to the general populations, it would be an extremely important step. May, may, may I yes, briefly sure. ask? So, so you, you just spoke about diagnosis. Prevention is also something that people yeah. sort of, of often raise. Is that something that, you know, in, in a hospital setting you even think about? Is that like this general population that you need? Yeah, because that's obviously... I think this is still a right? neglected topic. So we, we diagnose and treat, but uh, to imp imply or establish preventive medicine uh, in, in the general healthcare system is still a problem. So Julia is nodding also. <laughs> Would actually uh, your vision of preventing uh, or utilizing AI also for prevention be aligned with what you're thinking of? 
I think, yeah, but you might be out of your job then, right? If, <laughs> and that's the, that's the problem. There is no money in prevention. So pharma companies are not that interested in that because they can sell fewer drugs. We have to, that's the, the thing of it. But um, AI is, is increasingly being used for very early detection of disease. Early, in a case, for example, in lung cancer, where small nodules appear and you don't know whether they will go away, whether it's just inflammation or whether they reappear, what kind of nodule it is, whether it's a glass or of subsolid or whatever nodule. So it, it can actually characterize these much better. And if you could detect them much earlier, just for example, you cycle to work, have a little accident, unfortunately, um, get a chest x-ray, and then they find a nodule at such an early stage that they can do something about it. If you mm -hmm. wait till you've got a very, very uh, persistent cuff, uh, your, your chances of survival will, will be much lower. So early detection of disease, but early detection of recurrence of disease is also important. If you're being treated successfully, hopefully, can you predict whether you will get back the disease? Or early detection of response to treatment is also important. So will radiotherapy or chemotherapy help or not because you might be saved from a very toxic or awful treatment which you didn't need because you could have gone straight to surgery for example right so there are lots of options where, where AI could actually be quite quite helpful in that scenario ideally I think we should go into prevention we would have fewer patients <laughs> well, that I think is the ultimate goal right <laughs> well there is always different type of stakeholders uh, in the whole process and then also in not only in the patient treatment but also in the prevention we have the patients we have the doctors we have for example also the health insurance system that would I think love the prevention prevention part because it would save a lot of costs and also make it um, probably a little bit more efficient in that space. But of course there are other industries that um have different type of interest levels at that stage. And uh, coming back here and looking at the time, I think uh, it is time for questions out of the audience. So I will hand over to Adam now and uh, hopefully to the audience. So thank you. Um, if you're watching online, then please leave your questions in the chat there. But if you're watching physically here, please raise your hand and so we can get a microphone over to you. Oh, there's a question here already. Please stand and introduce yourself. Hi, oh, excuse me. My name is Garrett. I am uh, previously from Stanford. I have a question in regards to how some of the new AI verification techniques are currently influencing your opinion of AI and popular opinion. So explainability and verification, like algorithmic formal verification is being thrown around a lot and there's serious research behind it. There is, however, the other question is how do people receive that? Mathematically, you can say something is formally verified to do a certain job, but as we've seen in the last few years, how much people actually trust that is a whole different matter. What's your assessment on, on a, the level of explainability and the level of verification when we need, or would that is not even the correct question? Thank you. Julia, please. Yeah, so thank you for that question. So formal verification is really, really hard because we're dealing with medicine and medicine there was a saying, not from me, and I apologize in advance, but medicine would be a science if it weren't for patient variability. So it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. The only way you can do that is to put it on clinical trials. This is basically our formal verification. This is can we predict outcome correctly? And that's ultimately what's the patient survival after five years in cancer, for example. Can we, can we do that correctly? So that would be my answer. Having said that, we're doing a lot of benchmarking. We're using lots of retrospective data. Um, so the community, in my community, we've got these challenges, which we, we are we actually competing against each other to improve our models and push down the error even more. And these are really helpful. These are really like test runs of, of, of the self-driving car, if you want. But in the end, you have to put it to the road test. You have to bring it to the clinic and see what happens. I'm going to alternate between a physical and virtual audience. We've got a question from Joel online who says, um, who asks what the strongest wall um, between uh, that we have today is that's stopping us getting to a world where we can uh, at scale diagnose disease with artificial intelligence. It, is that wall a technological wall at this stage or is it something else? Fabian? I, I, have, I have a quite some opinion there. So I think 
as you saw also in this nice summary, each of us is working on one particular scale, right? And you kind of have to have a focus, right? You want to bring that particular story then to a shape. But if you go to a practitioner, you know, typically they kind of start looking at the whole of you and, you know, they have sort of this maybe more general setup in mind. And of course, when you go to a specialist, then maybe it's a little bit lost. But I think in general, I think at some point, this big challenge of, of data integration, of sort of really thinking about maybe about different levels, maybe about different stages of the dogma as well, sort of about different type of modalities that, that we read, but then maybe also like history data, that's why, you know, each eye I think would be quite important to have. Like, adding all of that to a unified joint discussion and then being able to deal with missing values as well, I think it's something people start doing and there's some quite exciting work happening on at least shorter term complex data integration type of topics, but I think this is still missing. So I think from the pure methodological type of view, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening where you bring many of these things together. And I haven't now talked about that many of these actually might not be available to get started, but you know, we had this before. I think also, as, as even Wolfgang men mentioned in his earlier answer, we always get, we're getting more specific diagnoses where there's no longer just one type of lung, lung cancer and everything. It's, it's also about getting to decisions and actions. Let's turn to our physical audience. I see there's a question right back there and right back there I've been neglecting today, so let's turn over there. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Marina and I'm working in, in the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig. Uh, for the first time in my research, I have some results that I'm really enjoying and I have good class classification accuracy and I, I'm using neuroimaging to diagnose a language type of dementia. And I'm actually really interested to bring it forward and maybe at some point to translate it to the real life. But I, ha I have so many possibilities now. I can test my model in several other cohorts. I can put it into the pr uh, prospective study. What would be the pragmatic way to move forward? And also, we scientists, we have no idea how to translate this code in R or Python into a program itself, maybe, maybe it would be great to train scientists in that as well. Thank you. Maybe this would be a question for the interdisciplinary part. <laughs> I was just or thinking. Julia? I was just thinking this is a question for Fabian because this is exactly the point he tried to make about interdisciplinary training. So you can't be a physicist or a chemist or, or a mathematician who can't program anymore. I think it becomes your daily tool. So you have to, you know, build it into your education at some point. It might be only at PhD level, so which, which is a, a great point to start. It might be already part of your, your other studies. Um, I'm afraid I can't help you with your actual <laughs> research problem. It sounds really exciting, though. Of course, you want to to use it prospectively in the end. That's that's the actual road test, right? You want to actually be completely blinded um, to the outcome and want to check up a couple of years later how your patients did and whether you actually did the right choices for them. That actually could already mean intervening with treatment, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's, that's where we are still a bit stuck, I think, that we actually stratify patients to you get that treatment and you get that treatment, but that's where AI I will be heading. Yeah, I have yeah. a little thing to add, I think psychiatric disease, I'm not exactly sure if that's the setting, but I think it's one of these really exciting areas where I do see quite some potential for AI. You know, we, talk, we were talking about things where we, you know, we can speed up stuff with AI, where we can, you know, just sort of make processes do at scale that we couldn't do before. You know, you, you do, let's say, one protein structure a year, now you do it a second. That's a big thing, right? It's huge. But in this case, you know, people often don't even know how to properly define depression. I mean, what's that, right? I mean, you have a bunch of catalogs, but it's sort of these human-made categories that we need to think and that we need to talk about and so on. But obviously, that's not reality, right? Reality is sort of a gradient, and I guess we're all a little bit depressed from time to time. But then there's like this background. So how, like, if you can come up with some more tangible, potentially even molecular or maybe also phenotypic readout of that particular disease phenotype and then characterizes and uses for some type of stratification, I think that could be quite some impactful downstream. I hope you'll th uh, thank our panelists in the um, acknowledgements of your next publication. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn back to our online audience. Pascal is really interested in the low-hanging fruit. What can, we, uh, what can we tackle with all this at scale as soon as possible? 
as I think, as I already pointed out before, the, I think the low-hanging fruit are, is the image analysis. Uh, <laughs> radiologically as well as pathologically, since there we can maybe identify patterns, we can also make, as you said uh, before, uh, make some prognostic uh, values. Also, uh, have uh, with therapy response is, is very important. Long-term outcome is very important. I think with these uh, uh, methods used in radiology and pathology, this is uh, the low-hanging fruits. It, it's much higher hanging fruits to combine than the molecule with the protein and the, or, the, the organelle and the whole organism uh, and bring all these things together. But I think there could be the next step. The other thing is maybe uh, if you look at all the uh, ECG uh, things, also all the, the biosensors that we are using, if we can use it in somehow a standardized way. I mean, many of you are wearing Apple watches or other watches, and you generate such a whole bunch of data. Uh, you just need to rightly characterize it and, and categorize it, and then may also be used uh, in the future. I might add, oh, sorry. I might add to that preclinical drug discovery, how we think about making molecules, how we think about, say, protein binding, a lot of other things. We're really seeing a lot of great AI tools uh, coming in that area that are going to help with an important phase in drug discovery. And I, I'd be shocked not to see incredible progress in that in the next few years. Let's turn back to our physical audience here. There's someone right at the back in front of the large camera over there. So. And please stand and introduce yourself. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for a fantastic discussion. My name is Victor Israelit from Hilfol uh, Centrum here, and um, I have a question more of the ethics side of the question. So each time when artificial intelligence comes into play, there is a question: Who is responsible for these decisions, and how would medicine tackle with this? Thank you. Who wants to take this? Okay. Wolfgang? Yeah, so I mean, this is, it's a, it's a quite important uh, question. And I mean, we have very strict regulations concerning our ethics committees, where uh, this is very tightly uh, regulated in the, in the uh, uh, different states. So we don't yet have, uh, for the whole Germany, uh, ethics rules. We have to go in, uh, individually in every uh, state, but I think there is some very tight regulation, and we have had some changes in the last year with uh, different uh, ethics committees now acting EU-wide. So I think this is very tightly regulated. The other point that uh, may uh, come into play, if, if you have very detailed analysis of data, you may be able to come into the problem of the re-identification of individual patients only according to the genetic proteomic imaging data, which also has to be, we have to be confronted with this and we have to solve this. I think these are, I think the ethic regulation, sometimes we think we are a bit over-regulated to uh, express it very carefully. I mean, I mean, the point you make about privacy, right? That's yeah. actually, could be a challenge, but you know, can, can I also make it a feature? You know, there's a lot of advance actually in AI now with the say differential privacy and so on, where people actually start thinking how can you maybe build the algorithm in such a way that is privacy aware or potentially maybe also scramble the data and sort of still be able to predict whatever you need. So I think it's also an interesting and upcoming area then to then tackle these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's all the time we have for questions from this our last circle panel of today. So I'll hand back for final thoughts. So thank you very much. So what we've heard uh, in the last 50 minutes, or barely 50 minutes, I think was very, very interesting, given all the expertise we had today on the table from the different type of areas. And uh, we discussed the potential, we discussed the interdisciplinarity of AI and medicine. And I'm very, very happy that so many good success stories were also shared, where we are thinking about what really can be done positively by applying AI, and also where we are at the moment. So I would like 
like to thank my guests very, very much. This has been an outstandingly great uh, plenary table, and I'm very honored that you have been here. And I think also for the audience, you contributed a lot of very valuable information, and we are all very, very happy to see what's going to be coming in the next five to 10 years with AI in medicine. Thank you very much.